I want to talk about uh, a, two th a thing today that annoys me about what we're doing here, because I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I keep seeing the same uh, mistakes being made or the same arguments being done. Uh, and most importantly, I think we consider ourselves more important than we actually are in that market where we are. I, mean, we, we, I remember like 2006, the first conferences here in London when nobody cared about web development and all these people that have like beards and suspenders and work on like Java and these kind of things were laughing at us for using JavaScript. And now there's a JavaScript conference every week and we're like, we're the forefront of IT. And I work for Microsoft now, so I get into these discussions with like people who work in banks and insurance companies and I see the infrastructure that they're using and I'm like well the stuff that day to day we rely on on software has nothing to do with what we do not in terms of stack not in terms of quality not in terms of maintainability we actually build for 40 years terrible terrible things and hope nobody realizes it so I think it's very important for us to consider our place in that space because the wonderful thing about the web, and I've been doing it for 20 years uh, in like companies like Agilisys, Yahoo, eToys, Mozilla. I wrote a lot of books and I'm a member of like several WSUC groups as well. And I just found that the, the movement of the web became so fast because everybody's invited to play with us. So I think it's very important that we as a community stay inviting and stay interesting and stay not opinionated about one certain thing. But when I actually do this daily right now, going on a Twitter in the morning, it's like I, I get up like this and I feel happy. And then when I go on Twitter, I look like this after a short while. <laughs> That's also the difference if you have to, uh, I moved from England back to Germany, so I had good new passports and everything. So that's the difference between a photographer and going into a photo booth. Especially when you have your dog on a lead and people are playing with your dog outside while you're trying to take a picture. This is how that second picture happened. But it just annoys me that like there's only fighting in this community by now. Everybody has a great opinion and forces other people it on other people rather than like being the nurturing and supportive thing. When the web was not as defined as it is now, when we just had to fight the browser on every on every single front, we actually were a better community because we just did things. We're like, hey, I did this with CSS. Do you think it's working? And not like I did this with CSS. I put it in an npm package. You should use it right now or you're not professional. So we actually get into, this, into these discussions that don't make any sense to me. And this is what I call that front-end turbulence going on right now. So if this JavaScript versus CSS, frameworks versus vanilla, brevity versus maintainability, tooling versus low barrier of entry, client versus server, native versus web, mobiles versus desktop, cats versus dogs. We, have, uh, we find a reason to argue for our everything. And in essence, we never look at the, at, at, the, uh, at the environment, why somebody did something. A lot of times you could look at software or, or, or products that people build and they're horrible. And we think it's because those people are terrible programmers or bad designers. But most of the time, it's not our decision that caused these kind of things. Uh, during my career, I always fought like other project managers. I fought marketing. I fought like end users. I love it when you work in an agency and you make like three designs for a client and you make one that is obviously so ugly that they should choose one of the other two and then you have then they chose that one. <laughs> and you're like, this was a joke, you know that. Like no rotating unicorns on your insurance website. And you're like, well but it's so cool. My my son loves it. Like you cannot win. So I love these, and I analyze this a bit, like the things we say to each other without considering context. You put some code on Twitter, and there's like 12 things, or I don't know how many it is because I haven't prepared my slides. Um, basically, there's, there's these immediate reactions that come back from it, like, this does not work when the data you put in is impure. Like, you know, like I, I had like three lines of JavaScript, and they're like, yeah, if this array has like things in it that are like null value or, or, or strings, and I'm like, I created the array that goes into that. I just wanted to write this little piece of code. I control the data. Not everything has to become this thing that any data can go into. Although we always say like, that's the cleanest way of coding. Or this doesn't perform when you have a lot of data. Like this, this doesn't scale to 10,000 objects in JavaScript. And I'm like, where do these 10,000 objects come from? Why do we have them? Instead of just saying like, this needs to scale to infinity. This should be written much shorter is my favorite when people are like, oh, I, I know how to write shorter code than you. And I'm like, I wrote in Perl for three years. I can write unreadable bullshit that you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> and that does 10, 10 things at the same time. 
this does not work in old browsers, which is always my favorite. Like, yeah, but Internet Explorer 6 users will not get this. And I'm like, yeah, and they shouldn't. They're not used to beautiful things. We, we confuse them with complex interfaces. Just give them forms and they're happy. And they're, they're, they don't want to use computers. They have to. Um, this is not accessible is a, is a, is a, pre, a pretty problematic one because I, I'm very much about accessibility and I love that everything has to be available for everybody. But just saying like, oh, this is not accessible to people who are blind might mean that it's actually highly accessible for people who are dyslexic or people who are hard of hearing. Accessibility is not a binary state. It's basically a grayscale. I mean, I've got glasses and then I realized I get old and I now have uh, uh, very focal glasses and these kind of things. Uh, the, or as we go through life, our ability change and our accessibility needs to change with it as well. So saying like, this is not accessible because I know this should be like that is a terrible thing. Because my main problem is these are knee-jerk reactions. These are like these quick reactions on things that basically, instead of thinking about why people do these kind of things. So we create these indefensible accusations by zooming out and disregarding circumstances. So we basically say like, oh, this is not, this doesn't scale to lots of data. And we never even question if it needs to or where, what this thing is going to be used at. So we're, we're always doing that way. And a great thing is because if we do it because we look clever and we look like we're caring more about the web than the person that put his code or her code out there for the world to see. Like this is just amazing how we, we criticize somebody for sharing instead of just like, oh, this is good, but maybe there would, uh, the, if you want to scale it to infinity, that would be a thing to do and not like, you should make this work or it's not the right kind of code. Because is it worth discouraging people that way? I mean, as somebody who just wants to learn and I go out on Twitter and I see people that I look up to arguing with each other like three-year-olds, it's not a fun experience and I probably don't want to be part of this community then. So shaming people publicly and blaming them for things that are not necessarily a problem, I don't think it's worth it because we want this community to keep growing and to keep being relevant as well. So is the right place and time to argue for quality when the product is done? And I think not at all, because the, the, the final product is not what we wrote as code at the beginning. We always have great intentions. We write wonderful, clean things, and then things happen, like people happen, and input happens, and, uh, and changes happen, and we're just like, the more and more, there's like millions of cuts how the product ends up life, what we don't want to be. Every, probably everyone here in the room who's a developer heard that lie that like, oh, let's do it quickly and then later on you get time to fix it. <laughs> this is never the case. This never happens. It's just a lie. Don't, don't try to get encouraged by that. My favorite thing about when it comes to the CSS versus JavaScript is that uh, uh, exclamation mark important because it's just this wonderful, confusing moment. As a CSS person, important means this is so important, it should not be able to override. And it's actually something that is kind of an anti-pattern because it becomes not overwritable by something else. So it basically is too strict to be in code that somebody else needs to use. Of course, there's bugs like in Internet Explorer 7 and 8. If you use 64 classes and one element, it overrides important, but you shouldn't rely on that either. And as a CSS developer, if I see this in production, I know some JavaScript person has written CSS. As a JavaScript person, I see this and I'm like, that's the way how I make CSS work because it doesn't show up unless I put 12 of those in there. Or like use five IDs on an element, not realizing that an ID should be a unique identifier per document. And as a JavaScript or a Java or a C Sharp person who never seen CSS, this means not important. You know, it's, it's, like, it's no wonder we're not talking to each other in these communities when, when things like that happen. Maybe we should do a question mark important. Maybe it is, maybe you don't, you know? It's like some APIs are like that. My favorite API when it comes to HTML5 is the can play through thing for the video element. There, there's a video element you can say like can play through uh, and you give it the, the mime type of the video. And it has three return values. Probably, maybe, and empty string. <laughs> I still don't know why this API exists, because if I want like vague answers, I talk to people, not to APIs. Like, can you play that through? Maybe. Like, what was the use of that conf call, of that API call kind of thing? Okay. Things that should matter in a web product, if we think about it, are, are several of them. It's accessibility, it's interoperability, like make it available for everybody, make it available for every device, because we cannot control what our end users 
uh, used to go on the web. And believe me, I wish we could, but we can't. It's just not a, not our place to do it. Performance, make the thing work well. But if you're offline <laughs> uh, or if you've got slow connectivity, then it's a, a very important thing. And security, because people are stupid. It's, security is depressing. Like you do so many wonderful things and then people use password one, two, three as their password or they, they share their two-factor authentication with another phone that is actually not secured and it's just terrible. I love when you have computers and people are like, can you fix this thing? If you ever need to fix a Mac for somebody and it's not an encrypted hard drive, just do Apple S when you start the thing because you get into a terminal and you can access the whole machine. This is something that they built for the geniuses in the in the shop to actually fix Mac. So that's one Wonderful. Now we have a great, a great stack though. We've got HTML, which is basically marking up and the foundation of any web product out there. HTML, by using things like button elements, you get like accessibility to a degree for free because it's keyboard accessible, it's focusable, it actually has the states built in as well, the, the, the press state, the depress state, which I always like, like, did you depress that button? Yeah, I told him it's ugly. It's not a right thing to do, but uh, people use diffs and then put spans on it and simulate HTML. So if you actually look at HTML, what it can do for you, there's a lot of opportunities there. And the great thing is when it comes to responsibilities, the browser is basically taking most of the responsibility, the standard as well, and you have a bit of responsibility to use the right HTML element. To, to find out what's there. Like, yeah, a link should be uh, something pointing to something. A button can be something accessing some JavaScript functionality. A link should not cause JavaScript functionality because then it breaks when JavaScript doesn't work, which can happen all the time. With CSS, we, we always talked about CSS, especially as like, oh, you can make it pretty and you can put colors in there. But by now, CSS has become a proper layout engine and a proper animation engine and a proper rendering control as well. And with Houdini, you can even write JavaScript to, uh, to create CSS functionality. So it's not that black box anymore that you just have to try or trust. You actually understand how CSS renders things. So uh, the responsibilities there are kind of similar as well. The standard has a bit more responsibilities because CSS changed a lot over the last few years, whereas like HTML stayed the same since HTML5 more or less because it's harder to change those things. And JavaScript, of course, is magic, and we can do whatever we want with JavaScript because you can generate CSS in JavaScript, you can generate HTML in JavaScript, you can generate music, you can generate codecs, you can generate everything in JavaScript right now. But that, of course, means that you're, respons you're responsible for everything. A CSS animation, the browser jumps, th uh, jumps through hoops and bends over backwards to make sure that your CSS animations work. Your JavaScript animation on a slow machine might actually not end. So it's your job to monitor your frames per second if they become too slow, end the animation and jump to the end state so you don't have any interfaces that are stuck halfway through. So a lot of what CSS does for you, you can do in JavaScript as well, but it's your responsibility. And I'm lazy. I don't want that responsibility, especially not in an environment where I can't control it, where I don't know what people use as their end products or as even their, their platforms that they run my code on. But still, it's very tempting as a developer and as somebody who feels very clever to want to do everything on my own. So to me, the argument JavaScript versus CSS is basically more or less like, do I want to give the control to the browser or do I want to control everything myself? And as I see how many products I worked on and how much I had a chance to revisit these products later on, maybe giving some control away to the platform is not the worst idea because you're not going to have time to fix that code later on. We're well prepared to create magic. Like with JavaScript nowadays and with the browsers that we have and the environments we have right now, we can create amazing web products that are basically very much in, uh, on par with native applications. In Microsoft, we're now more or less giving up on fat client applications. Everything is going to be web applications and progressive web apps. So next week, we're going to have our conference where we're going to announce a lot of things with partners that are PWAs rather than like, oh, install this and it, it updates every two days without you wanting to. So we have developer tools in browsers and they give us so much insight. They give us like the, the, the network stack, how much memory was used, the performance of the thing, uh, the security. We can audit it in the browser itself. So we have full insight into our products and how they behave. And to me, who started a long time ago, this is a dream come true. We just had alert and basically hope that we, we get some information out of it. We just had zeros and ones and sometimes we use the letter O because the zero key was broken. 
we have development environments that are open source, written in TypeScript, like Visual Studio Code, that while we're coding, gives us explanations what the thing is, rather than having to go to a browser tab and look it up and understand it. So we have this in-context help to, to know what we're doing. And it should be it should be something that we embrace much earlier on. Like it's always very exciting when we talk to people about the web, and they're like, "All you need is a text editor. You can use TextPad or whatever to start your first website." But this one gets you so much further. I love the integration of uh, of Git in uh, in developer tools uh, in editors now. I say so. I don't have to explain Git to people. I'm like, okay, you did a change. There's this M next to it. If you click on that one and you describe what you've done and you send it off, other people can use your code afterwards. Not like go to the terminal, do these cryptic Git commands and do like minus C, minus C and then quotations and whatever. It's like just do it in the editor itself. It's a wonderful thing we have. We have GitHub, of course, as a way to collaborate and as a way to to send our code out to other people. If we get hit by a by a bus, your code lives on by having it out there. And when I look at GitHub and for people to hire, I don't look necessarily at your code. Of course, I do, but I also look at how you cre how you deal with other people. How do you deal with uh, forks? How you deal with pull requests? How you deal with comments? And that way, I also I already know what you're going to be as a team player in your company as well. So what you do on GitHub is very very important as a as a as a job for the future as well. Because this is a place to shine. This is a place to be nice to each other and to actually show how companies how collaborative coding should work as well. I still wished I had been at the first pitch of GitHub when they go to some VC and say like, oh, we do. Uh, a social network for developers. They're like, you mean social interaction and developers as a product? And they're like, yeah. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> so we're kind of empowered nowadays to write great things. We've got highly optimized code. We've got reusable clean components. We've got modular design systems, flexible APIs. These things are the things. I'm not going to read all of them to, out to you. These are things we can write with this tool set that we have of evergreen browsers, really good editors, uh, version controlling that is understandable and not like CVS or, or Mercurial or the things we did before. Social interaction is built into what we do. So we should build really great things. But if we look past our world of conferences, magazines and podcasts, it kind of looks different when you talk to the people who go to the office at 9 o'clock and leave the office at 5 o'clock and do some code in between. These are different people from us. They don't spend their free, their free time looking at things. And then you realize that it's not that important for people to actually care about the accessibility, the interoperability, the performance, and the security. Not because they're not caring about it, but because they're not paid to do it. They're not interested. They're not supported by their company to think about these things. They're just there to churn out code as quickly as possible. And you see it in the results. I, I know if you've seen this by the, uh, the WebAIM project, they did, did like the for biggest million websites out there and analyzed the security issues in them. And they had like low contrast and missing alternative text in almost every single website. And these are such simple things to do right. And they're so painful for people who cannot see or cannot see properly to be in, un, in, unable to use your product. And uh, the other one is, of course, that the products are full of cruff. When you look at the page weight percentiles of HTTP archive, you've got 90% of websites have 5.8 meg of data, random stuff downloaded to your machine. I've just been in Jordan, where with my German SIM card, 10 kilobyte of data, I don't know anybody who does kilobyte except for German mobile phone providers, costs me like 12 cent. So a 5.8 meg website is basically the same as a ticket to Endgame or some other cinema, and I hope your website is as interesting, because this is going to be really, really bad for you. I was, shocking. I was shocked getting home. I had just had my, uh, my roaming on for two days, 90 euros for two days, just for doing some random surfing out there. And this is bad. We should be embarrassed about this. But the problem is we're not necessarily the people who caused it. Because when we think about the web product stack, we always think like this is our world. We're like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We're like this is what you do everything in it. But when you look at what caused the product on the web, there's much more in there. So there's the back end, there's the content management system and the framework that people have been using that messes with your code. There's the servers and the cloud platform that might not allow a certain version of your code to run. There's the DevOps people, IT, legal sales, shareholders, and investors. All these people have a say in the products that we build. 
and most of the time they undo a lot of good that we as developers put in there. But we're arrogant enough to only talk to each other and think like we could never reach these people. And I think it's it's kind of unfair that our wonderful work is being torpedoed by other people in the company. Uh, not because of malice, but because they just don't know that what they're using might be interfering with the good intentions that we had. So our job should be to be much more visible to these other parts of the company as well and integrate it into decision making. So we're competing without knowing it. There's staying in budget is a very important thing for every web product. First to market is another big thing. Like, okay, I I know it's great that you love accessibility, but we got to be the first ones to roll it out. So we have to think about accessibility later, which is a no-go. There's just no way to think about accessibility later. And there's continuous growth. That's the other problem. A lot of our products that we build are actually either already listed on the, on the stock market or we have some VC company to make happy. So they want to see continuous change. They don't want to see quality. They want to see new features all the time. No matter if end users really ask for those things, it just needs to be a differentiator from your competition. So to stay in budget, reckless reuse is one thing that we basically do. And this is where frameworks and these things are very much cool for companies to do. I like Dylan Beatty's post the other day when he said, like, just creating a React app, an, an empty React app is like 1.5 million lines of code contributed by people in their free time, no process to actually the quality of it. And I don't think that is criticism of him to say like, this is how broken it is. It's just the way we've become. We just trust these things because we don't have time or our companies don't give us enough time to actually think about what we're doing. That just everybody else uses React. If it scales for Facebook, it's going to be probably good for that three page marketing website that you're building too. And no, it's not. You don't want to have these five mega JavaScript in there. But if you look at the uh, the web in general, it's assembled. 27% of sites are 90 to 99% third-party content. Nobody writes code from scratch anymore. And everything we talk about these events is like, when you start from scratch, you can create clean code from this and that. And you're like, yeah, but you already have a lot of stuff to deal with that you have to change and put your code inside it. And uh, uh, we, we have a lot of like legacy code that is still out there and will not, it refuses to die. So first to market is really bad for quality because you have to get it out there. So first, most of the time we build an MVP, um, a minimal viable project product. And it always drives me nuts. Cause like, okay, let's, it's, we know it's terrible, but put it out there cause we want to be first to do it. So most of the MVPs are basically bits of string and chewing gum, some spit and duct tape. And then we put it out there and say like, look, we got a product with the first to market, which would not be a problem if we killed those things. You know, if we, if, if we build an MVP, we delete it. We do another MVP, we delete it. We did another one, we delete it, but we don't. In the Flash world, we did this back then. Basically, nobody cared if your game that was successful for the last three weeks will be played in seven years' time. They're just like, yeah, I, I write the next game, fine. But on the web, we actually keep putting MVPs out there, and then we put something extra there to make them grow and make them work. That what I said earlier, like you're going to get time later to fix it, which you never get. How does this continuous growth happen? And it's mostly stickiness and analytics. Instead of like building something that people love, we put like libraries there, seeing how many people are using it. And when people don't use it, we give them like, how about a pop-up window to ask for notifications? How about we, we give you like a pop-up window to sign up for the newsletter for the article that you haven't even written yet or haven't even read yet. So that's why we have reader modes in browsers and stuff because we put all this stuff in front of people because we hope they love it then. And again, this is another uh, 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 analysis and I'm putting all these links out later on as well, where we realized that most of the craft of the web is third party stuff. It's it's not our code, it's things that somebody else in the company puts on top of our code to make it a sticky product. And yeah, it's sticky in, st in the sense of sticky things that you shouldn't touch, but it's basically that. So we build an MVP and then we actually put the analytics on there. So we know who actually uses our stuff. And then we put marketing features on there like notifications and uh, newsletter features. And then we, put a, uh, we realize it's actually getting slow. So we put it on a beefier cloud system. We put AWS, Azure or whatever. And then we actually have an enterprise rollout. Our product becomes successful and out of a sudden people have to think about people who don't speak English and actually have maybe a right to left rendering and these kind of things. So out of a sudden this MVP that should have died a long time ago is this, this like Frankenstein monster of code that we need to make work somehow. So what happens at the end of this process is that every company goes into panic. And what do you do when you, when you do panic? You basically 
you hire some consultants to help us with the accessibility, the interoperability, the performance, and the security of the thing. And uh, it's tr it's frustrating, but I loved working as a consultant because you tell people things that are already broken. You, they know these problems. They just don't want to talk to each other about it or be the one that tells their company that it's broken. So they pay you for the uh, for the insight that they already have, which is cool. But it's sadly enough how our market works at the moment. Because when it costs money to pay somebody for it, it's more important other than talking to your own engineers and, and trusting them. So the web as a platform is kind of ripe for abuse, and that's basically the beauty of the web, but also the problem of the web. The web is defined as forgiving developer error. You, that's why XHTML never came, became a thing, because one little rendering thing and people wouldn't have a website. We, one of the tenets of the web is like, we protect the end user from stupidity of the developer. And that's browsers had to do that forever. We can't break the web. When we released Edge as a brand new browser with the Edge HTML engine, we're like, look, this is how everything standards compliant. And then no website worked because people relied on Safari specialized code, on things only in Chrome, on things only in Internet Explorer at one time. We actually put a lot of stuff on the web that is not standard standards uh, uh, compliant. So every browser needs to copy the code from other browsers and the mistakes from other browsers just do not break the web. And past browser competition has also non-reliable standard APIs that live products rely on. I still have to deal with people that deal with Silverlight or uh, uh, Flash components or things that basically like, that's how a browser made it different to others. Like Internet Explorer, uh, 4, no, Internet Explorer 502 had colored scroll bars and people are like, oh, we rely on that one. You're like, oh God, really? So that adds a lot of cruft and security attack vectors because code that has been used in 1999, like VML, for example, in Internet Explorer 6, is now a security attack vector because that code hasn't been touched. So as uh, when something gets older, it gets more vulnerable to attacks. So basically, as we can't remove it, the bad people of the web are going uh, gonna to abuse it. And we can't stop developers from being sloppy. We cannot just tell, like, this is how you should do the web. Some companies try, but people are just not wired that way. So we have patches and solutions for these kind of things, and this is where it gets really embarrassing for us as developers. That a thing like AMP exists, just because we most developers didn't build fast websites, is kind of sad. That Safari is limiting JavaScript and says like only that much JavaScript is allowed before we actually cut it off because you're overusing JavaScript, is basically Safari protecting its end users from our bundling things. Chrome's never slow mode as well, and all kind of blockers. People are always so excited when they have blockers in their browsers, and you're like, what you do with that is just to make advertising more aggressive. It's an arms race that none of us can win. So we should actually find a way to make the web be a, um, be a thing where you can make money without plastering everything with trackers and advertising instead. So there's a few ideas there, but nothing that is viable at the moment. So this is all kind of depressing for me as a developer. Like I'm seeing that, that, that the web is in that state and at the same time, we've got all this beautiful technology and beautiful build processes and tool chains to work with. So there's, where's that disconnect? What can we do about it? So what can we do as developers to work around that issue? And I hope I'm not depressing you too much, but I think it's very important that we realize we're part of a much bigger world than we think we are. We're not that much in control of our destiny in this case. I love this uh, CSS Tricks article, make it hard to screw up driven development. Development. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. Like by, by teaching people the web, starting with Visual Studio Code and with GitHub, I already teach them to say like, here's an editor that can help you not screw up. And here is actually a way how your code can be looked at by other people and, and worked with other people without you actually being the sole person that has to maintain it for the rest of your life. We've got browser tool audits in developer tools. We've got auditing reports that give us all kind of insights. And these are things to show to your managers, to show the people like, I didn't do this 90% speed problem there. Where is this 90% speed problem? If you see any of the talks by Harry Roberts, he's like, that's what he does with clients. They pay him for doing the most obvious things of saying like, you've got 15 third-party libraries doing tracking in there. What do they do? And most clients can't even answer what these things do. They've just been doing them for like the beginning of time and keep reusing them in every product. 
if you don't like what uh, Lighthouse or developer tools do, there's WebPin.io. WebPin.io is basically doing the same thing, but you can configure it to your needs. So you can turn off all the things. If you if PWA checking is not something that's applicable to your product because it's an internet page, you can turn that off. If you need a, if you need a quality control that your company logo is in every footer of the page, you can write a hint, which is a JSON object basically, to test this, and you can make it part of your continuous integration. You can make it part of saving your content. So it's an NPM module rather than part of the developer tool, so you can use it completely independent of the browser and independent of third-party resources as well. It's also an extension to, uh, to, to code. So if you now write an HTML document, it tells you the HTML element needs a language attribute or the, uh, must, uh, it needs a language attribute because otherwise a screen reader will try to read it with a German voice and it's English and it's not fun. Or it needs a, ca a character set to have the proper encoding. UTF-8 without the dash has been used of like 90% of the websites out there and if browsers wouldn't allow the misspelling and the other thing, we basically wouldn't have a web. But I love that when you type an image in there, it says like it needs an alternative text, otherwise it's not an image. So while you're writing your code, you already get reminded of best practices rather than some Somebody on Twitter telling you, you should have made this accessible. It's much more interesting to get it while you're coding rather than learning about debugging, uh, rather than learning about coding. So all these things are built for us. So browsers are, have feedback channels, developer tools have feedback channels. All of these things are open source available to us. So we need your input to make these things important and good for you. What can we do better that you can write great code without having to actually do uh, jump through different conditions? And I think we should stop arguing amongst ourselves which technology is better because, uh, yeah, CSS does things, JavaScript does things, Angular does things, Vue does things. You never know the context of the whole product, why a certain framework was chosen. And it's always clever to say, like, you could do this without it, without, and you can, I can do it better on my own. And you're like, yeah, but we had to roll it out within a month. So contributing to products people use, content management systems, build tools, and frameworks, I think is much more important than telling people off that their JavaScript on Twitter is not scaling to infinity. Because as I said, a lot of these things go on the web and never get changed. So our best practice, our quality thinking should go into these reused components rather than like our own thing telling, but if I had my way, I would be so much better. And people use this. The web is being is not a thing anymore where we start things from scratch. I, should be, I think we should understand why people do things before telling them off. That's, a, that's maybe a good thing. I, I do this like 30 second thing where I'm like, I'm pissed off with somebody and then I think about it for 30 seconds and then probably most of the time I'm not pissed off anymore. Or I'm like, oh, maybe I want to ask why that person has done it that way rather than like, oh, it's wrong. You should, be, you should be feeling bad for doing it wrong. And I think we should earn our seat at the table where stupid decisions are being made. I'm now a principal developer. So I'm sitting in meetings with like product owners and these kind of things. And often I can say like, we could do this, but the developers would be really unhappy if they had to use this product. What can we do instead? And uh, your career is changing over time. So you will not be the coder in the corner that does magic all the time. You want to be the person that can go home from time to time and have a real life. So the web is plumbing. It's not the new hotness. It's like uh, kids these days don't even know what being offline means. People don't want to understand how a browser works. They don't want to understand what HTTP means. They're just, oh, this is online. This is where I can watch Netflix. This is also where I can upload images. Well, soon not anymore in Europe. But uh, this is where I can actually get my stuff. We, we, we just seen... Uh, we, we, we turn on the tap, we, water comes out, we don't want to know about the plumbing, we don't care about the plumbing. We go online, we are online, we use a browser, it's just a way of life, it's part of our lives nowadays. We only get to get interested in it when it doesn't work, much like plumbing. And as plumbers we deal with beautiful clear water and we also have to deal with other things and over my career I'm kind of tired having to deal with the other things instead of clear nice water. So. I think the next generation is already doing amazing things. This was a 10-year-old kid that used Angular and TensorFlow to do a machine learning driven app at some event. And I, I should be scared about this, but I'm actually power to you. The reusable components like using TensorFlow, using Angular, that we all have great ideas about what they are. If he gets to build something amazing with that and he's super excited about it, that person can then in the next step learn why it's working. But getting that first foot in the door and getting somebody empowered that way is something that I would love to think of about more rather than telling each other off that our code is not clean enough. And that's all I had. So thank you very much.